So again, we're moving on to our final uh, kind of talk of the session uh, before we have our uh, panel discussion or our group discussion. And as I just mentioned there, we're going back to the beginning as we look forward with John Bills talking about his experience of starting a movement in the movement science. Thanks a million, John. Over to you. Thank you, everybody, for um, sticking around to the end of the day. Um, do appreciate it. I know you've got one more thing after this, but uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure you're all getting tired. Um, so why am I giving this talk? I think it's always useful at the beginning of a talk to kind of outline why, basically, what you're going to learn from it. Um, be a, I know James is laughing there, but you'd be amazed at how many people don't. Um, fundamentally, I'm giving this talk because we are a collection of disciplines. Each discipline has its own cultural norms, has its own subdisciplines with their own cultural norms. And while Stork has done a good job of establishing a base across these uh, different disciplines and different cultures, the next step that I believe that we need in order to grow further is to inspire and equip other people and, and people within this, this potentially this call in this room to go and be that change within their own community. Okay, so what I wanted to do is try and give you some of the lessons I've learned in, in setting some of these things up. Um, there are lots of people in these, this call that I can thank as well, which is great. Um, and I will do as we go, but I just kind of wanted to outline exactly why I, I wanted to give this talk. So hopefully you can see my slides. In a somewhat bold move, I'm going to, especially given <laughs> uh, some of the criticisms we've had around popular science over the last couple of hours, I'm going to show you a TED talk, okay? It only takes a couple of minutes showing you uh, a, a humorous example of how to go about starting a movement. Again, why am I showing you a TED talk? Because it gives you a lens to view the creation of Stork, the creation of Sport Archive through in hopefully a somewhat entertaining way. Some of you might have seen this already. It's got a million views. It's been around for a while. Um, but here you are, hopefully. Let me know straight away if there's no audio and I'll, um, I'll fix it. There's no audio. No audio. Does anybody know how I can make it have audio? I think you need to share your system sound. Yeah, when you share a screen, you can go to, uh, when you share your screen, go to the very bottom on the bottom left. There should be a button saying share sound. I've as seen, I just got through after my 17th time to share both. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try again. Talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course, you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. 
So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. Okay, hopefully that will give you some, hopefully it's given you a bit of respite from the previous talks, but hopefully it will give you a lens to view the rest of this talk through as, uh, as I go through. So I, I need to do some caveats, okay, from the get-go. So this is... Uh, Dick Forsbury, if, if those of you that don't know, Dick Forsbury was the first guy to jump backwards over the high jump. Okay, the point of showing Dick Forsbury here is these aren't new ideas. Like when I was starting these things, I, I have got credit for some of these things, but they weren't new. Uh, basically, I was, I was ripping people off. I've been ripping people off left, right, and centre for the whole process. Um, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we do something. Okay, just to get, emphasize that we're all as preprint repositories, we're all building on archive. We still have discussions. Even today, I saw a bit of a Twitter storm with um, uh, young uh, PhD students talking about the risk of open science and publishing their work in preprints. Archive's been around since 1991. Okay. There's always been these risks. Even before Archive, there's been risks about the type of researcher that you want to be, okay? There's always going to be risks. Um, but ultimately, we have to do what we think is right. And if, if we think uh, adopting more rigorous, more um, uh, long-term scientific approaches is going to help us, which I think everybody in this room agrees with, then um, there's no better time to start than, than right now, fundamentally. I should also say that I was ripping off Spot, uh, Psych Archive as well, um, Psych Archive. Um, fundamentally, this whole idea of Sport Archive came about, I'm a, trained as a psychologist, first and foremost. I work in sport because it kind of fits my criteria of the sorts of places I want to work with. Um, I was also a coach and it kind of helped get in my foot in the door in the first place. But it was only due to the chance of kind of being, having one foot in, in both camps of sport and exercise and psychology. I kind of heard about these things before other people. I have no doubt that these movements would have happened ultimately, like eventually anyway. It was just a case of being in the right place at the right time. Um, and when I heard about Sci Archive, I kind of reached out to Brian Nozick, um, who you'll all know, and said, look, we really could do with something like this in, in, in kinesiology and sport and exercise science. And Brian said, yeah, I agree. Do you want to do it? <laughs> and that was kind of how it started. It's as simple as that. Um, and I think the next thing to talk about, really, I'm going to be quite quick with this because I want to try and create as much time for the questions at the end. The next step was to really. So Brian said, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. We can we can give you the infrastructure. What you're going to need to do is create this community. You're going to need to start to, to develop a culture uh, within within your discipline. And for the next three months after getting that approval, I contacted a load of senior figures in our field, basically with the uh, assumption that if I could get a couple of senior folks to get on board with the idea, that there'd be this kind of trickle down effect that people would see that they endorse it and then they'd hop on board. And I got absolutely no love whatsoever from, I think it was about 20 uh, senior academics. I won't name names publicly, but I'm happy to do so privately. Um, Basically, I was told that it either sounds good, but they're too busy, or to the other end of the spectrum, uh, preprints devalue the scientific record, record. Okay, and I don't want no part of it. So as top down was no good, I kind of went bottom up. And I reached out to my friends first and foremost, because you need people to help you kind of spread the word. And if you can't convince your friends that something has value, then you probably aren't going to be very good at convincing anybody. So I contacted uh, Dr. Fergus Guppy, uh, Dr. Mark Burnley, Ian Bordley, uh, Jamie Sims, they were some of the first people to get on board with becoming uh, Sport Archive's steering board. I also posted on Twitter, and again, Twitter was a lot more positive towards this, being, I think it tends to attract more progressive people within our field generally. Uh, people like Ian Bezodis, Catherine Franson, and Zach Zenko, who are in the room, uh, were some of the first adopters that really saw the potential of Sport Archive and came on board and became our first steering board. So the, the first lesson here is try and get your friends on board, okay? 
start with the people you know, start with the people that give you the time to really explain the content. Uh, if you know senior folks as well, that's a happy coincidence, but as an ECR at the time, I, I was a year out of my PhD um, when Sport Archive was founded. Uh, I really didn't know too many senior folks very well, and I knew a lot of ECRs through my PhD. So it depends on your route. The next step, and Zach will remember this, we had long discussions as a, as a board. Okay, so we've, we've created this thing. We've created this, this archive. Now we need to lead by example. We need to, to walk the walk. We want, if we want other people to jump on board with this and adopt this, uh, this approach to preprinting their work, we need to kind of show them the way. But actually, all of these concerns and fears around how we might be viewed for, for sharing work as preprints, again, by coming from ECRs, Lots of people had concerns around whether the papers, uh, if pre-printed, would be able to be published. It was all very, very new at the time in our field. And actually, even the steering board, it was quite hard to convince many members to actually adopt preprints and to, um, to be the first, fundamentally. They all agreed with it in principle, but they didn't often really want to be the one to actually go ahead and submit their work, all that hard work and effort that they've spent years potentially working on as part of their PhDs or something like that, um, and put that up to scrutiny. Fortunately, Katrin Franson agreed. Uh, she was the first person that, that published a preprint on Sport Archive. Um, and quickly after that, myself and many of the other Sport Archive uh, steering board members kind of followed in behind and, and started to populate the, the, uh, the repository. After that, after we'd kind of established uh, that the system would work, then the second wave of support really arrived. Um, Drs. Rose, uh, Rosie Twomey, Aaron Caldwell, uh, Matthew Bosgotier, all kind of followed in behind. Um, and for me, that was a real kind of key turning point. We started to expand, we started to attract external people. Okay, it wasn't my friends and some others at that point. It, it had reached the point where we were starting to be seen as credible to people outside of our immediate groups. It was also a tipping point because we, they brought hugely beneficial new skills into our group and a huge amount of enthusiasm that uh, really helped kind of push us on to the next phase. So we then had this repository, fledgling repository. Um, we needed to start building around it. Okay. And you'll notice this story kind of follows a very uh, traditional story arc fundamentally. So at the moment, things are going good, we're growing. We started to, to develop a website, creating artwork, policies, social media sites, soliciting submissions. We started trying to build around the repository itself, provide infrastructure to, to provide support and guidance to help people actually get involved and, um, and uh, make that first step. Also took some of the pressure off of me, having people like Chris uh, Hill come in and help with social media. Uh, subcommittees were formed, uh, Zach, Rosie, Aaron, Matt all kind of really stood up at that point, took leads in different areas and helped us grow in, in different ways. Then in around the fall of 2018, the Center for Open Science contacted me and the other uh, repository leads and said that they would be introducing charges from the 1st of January 2020. And just when we were kind of building a bit of momentum, we were hit with this issue of, okay, we've put our reputations on the line here. We've, we've been encouraging our, um, our friends and our collaborators saying that we've been told by OSF that this repository will be here uh, for at least 50 years. They've got all this funding. Now we're being told that actually, if we don't pay, we can't use it anymore. Um, it turned out that when they said it would be here for 50 years, they meant that existing articles would be there but they would stop submissions of new articles if we didn't pay the money and we really we were just a group of volunteers helping out trying to develop this this new uh, approach to uh, sharing the scientific record fundamentally um, within our field we didn't have huge amounts of money we we're all ecrs we didn't really have huge experiences of going out and capturing large grants like sci archive did um, so we had to come up with another way and at this time, lots of the other preprint repositories fell by the wayside. Um, and there was a piece in Nature at one point talking about how 
basically a lack of money is is stifling the development of, of preprint repositories in various different communities. So we had to think quickly and we kind of came up with this idea that if we're not going to be able to go out and get regular core funding, because we really don't know, don't know how to do that, maybe we could start trying to crowdsource uh, support and provide that kind of infrastructure around it. Maybe that could provide us with a sustainable option to keep both Sport Archive growing, but also to create a community where people could come together, share their own frustrations, share their own experiences, basically start supporting each other. Because I think one of the things that comes out from all of these discussions around open science more broadly is many people feel quite lonely and isolated and they have kind of often, depending on wh where they are uh, trained, they can often be working in a silo and, and often on their own in these kinds of areas. They don't necessarily have that mentorship. They don't necessarily have that support. Um, again, these are cultural changes and it's very difficult to, to make. So bringing something like Stalk about gave people a beacon, gave people a group that they could go to for help and support. Um, and I'll talk about how we've kind of grown at the very end of the conversation. So we, we had a real discussion uh, around our approach, um, how to kind of continue working with Sport Archive. Do we stay with OCF, uh, OSF? Do we move to another uh, repository? How will we fund it if we don't get members? It was it was a quite a, a turbulent time. Fun fundamentally, though, it's kind of worked out, and um, uh, and Stork has grown around Sport Archive and created that that base for it to continue. We were very fortunate as well that Christy and Aaron, uh, well, I should start by saying Aaron and, and uh, Andrew Vygotsky wrote or led on a paper um, called Moving Sport and Exercise Science Forward, a call for the adoption of more transparent research practices that Christy picked up on and helped write an article, uh, which kind of, again, raised credibility and spread word of Stork. I think we saw an increase on followers on Twitter uh, I think we saw hundreds of people basically flooding over a course of about a month period just because of this uh, article, because they'd seen it in the popular press and they knew how to find us, um, which is one of the big problems of starting something like this. So I'll, I'll be eternally grateful for Christy for her uh, for finding finding this paper and for Aaron and uh, Andrew for uh, taking the lead in, in writing it as well. So there we go. So we, we formed uh, Stork. And basically, yeah, people started to, to jump on board. We started to create, create a bit of momentum. We developed our first uh, uh, executive committee. Uh, we all went through election process. And here's our, our first group of people. And I think it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because it's very easy for this stuff to be forgotten and for people's contributions to be forgotten. And actually having something like this and having the opportunity to take a moment at the end of my tenure as past chair, and I'll kind of come on to this properly in a minute as well, to kind of put a full stop on where we're at um, and, and what we've done in the six years that that we've been in existence for um, as a group, not necessarily as Stork or Sport Archive, but as a group of people with a shared goal of trying to improve uh, kinesiology and, and sport and exercise sciences. One of the other key events was uh, led by Keith, I'm not sure if Keith's still around, um, Chris and Zach, who held a uh, event at NASPA. We also held events at ACS, ACSM that year. We'd also held smaller events at NASPA the year before. Um, I think this was a big turning point for me, seeing 50 people turn up for this talk uh, that, that Zach and colleagues led on. I think you'll probably see some of yourselves in this picture as well. I think Zach mentioned that Denver's in there and um, Laura, uh, yeah, some other people are in there as well. Um, have fun trying to spot yourself. The picture's quite small. Um, this was a real kind of key turning point, And we saw, again, big expansion after this. It kind of gave us credibility, at least within the sport and exercise psychology community, that these methods or, or the approaches that we were advocating for weren't going away this this movement had some legs there were people that were interested in it it wasn't going to just be explained away as a as a temporary phenomena um and i think this was a, a real key turning point for 
the development of uh, Stalk as well. We then went on to develop the journals. Uh, we had communications in kinesiology. We had registered reports in kinesiology as separate journals. We've now combined them temporarily whilst we get one journal up and running in full, trying to start two journals with limited resources, limited people was ambitious to say the least. If anybody's gone through that process, but we've learned lessons as we've gone. And um, ultimately the outcome is, is really the same that we've got a place for people to submit their work, submit their code, submit their data sets, get rigorous peer review and to publish work open access without paying uh, anything currently. Um, and hopefully that will stay like that as long as the stock membership continues to grow. Oh, I won't play, won't play that. Uh, so in February 2020, I handed the baton over to Vanessa uh, as the executive chair and Zach was appointed the uh, co-chair. Aaron moved on to the publications chair and Rosie outreach chair and I moved into the role of past chair. And I'm going to kind of sum up some of the accomplishments we've had over this first six years, but hopefully I've, I've got across that this has been very much a team effort in, in moving all of this and creating all of this forward. So accomplishments in the first six years, 450 preprints submitted, submitted to Sport Archive to date, 200 plus approximate people who have either been members or are members of Stork. Again, need to drill down exactly on these figures, um, but it's, it's an approximate. Seven papers published. There's four active submissions. I've been leading on one of these. It's, it's pretty much going to be eight imminently. Uh, six declined within the sport uh, within the stock journals. There may have been more. This was 23rd of May. We've obviously got our first stock summit here with 130 plus attendees. We had our, our summer school that Aaron led on with I think it was around 50 attendees. We've had the stalk series that I'm a uh, developed originally that's had over 2000 views of the videos collated so far and i've no doubt that that will continue to grow exponentially as as we grow as an organization and people are, are keen for knowledge and zach obviously led on the essentials of sport and exercise psychology open access book which i think zach can correct me later but last time we spoke it had close to 20,000 downloads um and i know that zach's been working hard to try to support the field to follow in his footsteps and make more open access textbooks available. And on our social media, we've got 2,031 uh, followers on our stalk account and 1,700 followers on our sport archive account. Okay, so some of the key lessons, the things that I've learned. So transformation is collaborative. It's only by listening to the needs and challenges of other people that we can find a common thread that binds us together, okay? It's only by listening and trying to understand other people's perspective that we can really find a vision, find a way of uniting people and, uh, and moving something forward. Transformation's hard. I've asked a lot of a lot of people to help me as part of this process. Okay, I can be a stubborn perfectionist that drives a hard, <laughs> a, a, a hard uh, process of working. I do know that. But I am absolutely thankful to everyone who's been involved in helping to set up and advance in both Sport Archive and Stork. I think fundamentally the product speaks for itself in what, in what we've produced in terms of uh, we've maintained Sport Archive, it continues to grow, we've created open access journals, we've created events like this which are cheap, really cheap and accessible for people. We don't put barriers to access to research, we don't put barriers to access talks like this. Okay, we have done a lot of good work in breaking down some of the traditional issues that have stopped people from engaging in this kind of work. And I hope that we continue to do that. The other thing I've learned is that transformation is slow. Okay, I assumed that we would be like psychology and everybody would jump on board and there'd be 12,000 submissions to Psych Archive after a Psych Archive after a couple of years. It hasn't been like that. It doesn't mean it hasn't progressed. It just means that the benchmarks were perhaps a, a were wrong in the first instance okay we are growing we have been growing uh pretty much consistently from day one there we will continue to grow uh and i, I think we have had some bursts but i wouldn't be at all surprised if 
bigger bursts are to come. The last thing is about transformation is about empowering other people. I think one of the key messages that I've that I wanted to try to impress onto Stork is that we can't be obstacles. Okay, so I got out of the way after one year of being the executive chair of Stork. It's not that I didn't want to continue. So I didn't want to block opportunities for other people. Okay. I hear lots of colleagues that have been editor in chief of their journals for 10, 15, 20 years. Okay. They say things like there's nobody better placed than me to be able to lead this journal forward. We will never know because you don't give anybody else a chance. Okay. One of the founding principles of stalk has been about empowering other people to give them the opportunity to step up and prove that they can do something. Okay. We've had, multiple committee chairs we've had multiple people come through vanessa's nearing the end of her term as executive chair and there'll be more opportunities becoming available for other people people at Ima have come in and, and made a huge contribution to the to the society and there will always be a place for that kind of transformation within stalk because it's embedded within our culture okay yes there will always be people that have expertise but we can provide support and those people can get out of the way and support the next generation to come and prove their worth and continue in that cycle. That's it for me. I hope you've got some questions. I'm happy to answer anything you've got. Um, and uh, hopefully that wasn't too long. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Um, Aaron, I wasn't sure if you were uh, if you were just rolling with it, but you did a little dance, and then I did a little dance, and I was hoping it was going to carry on. <laughs> I feel like we should do it now, people. Anyone who has the don't leave me hanging. <laughs> Can I just say apologies if that's a bit waffly in places? I was supposed to be home last Wednesday from a holiday. I took my two children to Legoland in Denmark, and my youngest caught chicken pox when we were out there. So I didn't actually get home until about 11 o'clock last night. Um, I had the slides already prepared, thankfully, but uh, I had hoped to give them a little bit more time and a little bit more practice before coming to this today. But uh, uh, the message is fundamentally easy to uh, easy to get across that it's all about other people and all about the great work that, that they've done fundamentally. But if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm very happy to answer them. Yes, I believe we could do this like the other one. Uh, firstly, I just like to say, John, that wasn't waffly at all. I thought that was a really great talk, and I feel a little emotional. Like those, <laughs> it was uh, inspiring. And <laughs> um, let's let's do the hand thing again. Chris, I saw your hand go up and then go down. Did you want to ask a question or? Oh, sorry, maybe I didn't see that. To be fair, it's not necessarily the sort of talk that lends itself to huge amounts of questions unless people have got a specific area uh, that they want some support in. I think, yeah. It's, it's so, if, oh, sorry, I see Aaron's hand. All right, I'll hop in. So, John, at the end there, you talked about kind of like handing off the baton. And uh, as someone who's kind of been at on or orbiting the exec committee for a couple of years i think everyone knows that i have my areas that i've kind of wedged myself into mm -hmm. but i feel the same i feel like the time is coming for me to start kind of seeding some of those controls for so if you all don't know i kind of do all the background stuff for communications and kines and sport archive how 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 do you think about dealing with those types of transitions because as the person holding the reins really i'm really afraid that as soon as i give someone else the wheel the car's gonna wreck i found uh, you aaron that's the trick <laughs> <laughs> you have to find the next person and you have to support them in that first year or so during that transition and then you have to get out of the way and let them put their own stamp on it as much as you possibly can and you'll know that it's not always easy. And there was definitely times in the first 18 months where I was just desperate to look, kind of steer things, but you, and that will be fine. That will be exactly the same for you, but that you, you have to, because otherwise yeah. you'll be one of these people that just become an obstacle. Um, and it's so easy to be that. And I think there are people in this room. I hope there are people in this room that will step up and take some of that, um, take that, some of that responsibility off of Aaron. Go on, Aaron. So for anyone listening, if yeah. you want, if, if you have any background in web development and management and would like to help out or publications in general and would like to help out, 
I would, and anybody with even, I would even go beyond that, Zach. Zach said of anybody with our Markdown experience, anybody experienced with typesetting and copy editing, I will gladly take the help. Um, uh, People yeah. willing so to learn. There's my plug. We don't, we don't always... I think it's that's oh. part of it, isn't it? Right, that we just we are we want to kind of upskill people as we go. So, yeah, yeah. Just so everyone knows, zero experience in any of those things before I started doing this. All self-taught, and then I can help self-teach you. Exactly. <laughs> How do you want to do this, uh, uh, Vanessa? Vanessa, I think Heather yeah, I yeah, I just want to say, like, to Aaron's point, um, we've been talking in the exec committee about having people kind of learn these skills and almost have a tutorial because I'm th I'm eager to learn things too. And I just want to say thank you to John because um, I took over and I knew zero. I still am learning, and I'm sure it was exceedingly frustrating for him to watch me kind of like try to figure the whole thing out. But one of the I just want to show one of the reasons I did is. Um, this movement is really energized by young investigators. And I, I still think I'm a young investigator, but then I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh yeah, not. So I just felt like I'm gonna try to hold this thing up while, you know, take on the grunt work while people are, you know, dipping their toe in. And then, you know, things are, are flying now with Zach and Aaron and Emer. so I'm, I'm thrilled, but I apologize for any frustration I caused, caused you, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, that, that goes both ways. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. I think it's it's about, so we're all educators. It's, all, it's basically this idea of scaffolding, right? That we want to try and put the framework around the people to provide the support that they need, but give them the room to grow themselves, okay? Um, and hopefully, hopefully, we've got a really good base now that we don't necessarily have to, we don't have to, be everything and do everything ourselves and we can grow and we can bring more people in. Uh, Zach? So thanks, John. Uh, obviously it's been a pleasure and a learning experience. Uh, I just wanna reiterate that yes, we definitely need people to learn, uh, people willing to learn um, and make that effort. No one was born knowing all of these things. Um, Aaron has been extremely helpful and I think will be helpful when we go through our next copy editing process, I'm looking forward to learning that. But we've had some other step up. And uh, this really just goes out to everyone that part of Stork and what makes it great is that um, I think most of us do want to rotate off the executive committee at some point and have others take the lead. And uh, that's going to happen for me and it's going to happen for Vanessa and Jennifer and Emer. And we've had some people um, express interest in possibly being the co-chair. I don't think we technically have one right now. Uh, Denver and, and Mike are attending our meetings uh, and, and learning and figuring it out. But the point is um, for anyone interested on this call and in Stork more uh, broadly, please reach out to one of us, right? If not in one of those positions, volunteer in some role and, and attend our meetings and just kind of get involved initially. Emer has a lot of people involved with the uh, outreach committee and organizing the summit because pretty soon it's gonna be, I don't wanna say the next generation, but the next batch of people leading and taking sport archive and hopefully the continued positive direction. What's that old saying? If you wanna go fast, if you wanna go, uh, fast go on your own if you want to go far go with other people and that's always been our approach and you have to take people with you you have to bring them along and we won't chuck you in at the deep end we have no and we but we want this to be we want this to outlive us fundamentally um and the only way of doing that is to to bring people in train them and support them and then let them go basically and, and do their thing I can absolutely vouch for that. When uh, I initially talked to Rosie, he was like, ah, I wouldn't mind being involved in the committee doing something. And she was like, cool, you want to step in as outreach chair? I was like, no, I don't have a clue. <laughs> in the first few meetings, I was kind of like, what? But I could just uh, absolutely assure everyone that comes in, it's a friendly group. We're all just figuring it out as we go along and uh, we figure things out. And there's always support. All right. Any last questions? Fantastic. Thank you for everybody for uh, 
for sticking around and uh, listening to me waffle about the history of Sport Archive and Stalk. John, thank you so much. Uh, I thought that was a really great talk. And I think we are coming to the end of our kind of scheduled talks now, and that was a fantastic one to wrap up on. Um, I'm going to stop the recording of this and just start it for our final discussion because it just makes it easier when we're uh, linking 